Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. It's uh, just at five past six, so I think we should start. Um, it gives me very great pleasure to welcome people here today. My name is Wayne Dooling. I'm here merely in my capacity of as chair of the Centre for African Studies at SOAS, but I'm also in historian of slavery, uh, so I have an interest in these topics. Um, our event today is um, uh, the culmination of, I shouldn't say culmination because I'm sure there's a lot more to come, but it's one major step uh, in a very long uh, project, ongoing project, which is headed by my colleague, Dr. Marie Roday, um, second uh, from your right, um, who is uh, a very well-established historian on West Africa, the West African Sahel, and very specifically on slavery. And Marie has been heading uh, this project and several projects, uh, which is the outcome of several major research grants. And Marie will uh, speak in uh, more detail about those grants. Um, but of course, today, we are here today and partly to commemorate the uh, uh, International Day for the Abolition of Slavery. Uh, and this project is, um, or at least the papers will hear today and the presentations will hear today speak very directly to that topic. And I guess I should say um, it's, of course, of no, it will be of no surprise to people in this room. And I should say we are, this is a webinar, so we have very many people online, um, but very many people in this country would think of the ending of slavery as having occurred with British emancipation uh, in the 1830s, first the ending of the British slave trade in 1808, and then the ending of British slavery in 1834, 1838. Um, and I guess some of us would associate the ending of slavery with uh, the long end in the Americas, in Cuba, and in Brazil. Um, but today we'll speak about the fact that slavery has a very long tail and continues in various forms today um, in parts of the African continent. And specifically today, we'll speak about the Sahel. Um, so without any further ado, I will hand you over to my colleague. But before I do so, uh, if I could say to people present, but also to uh, people online, if you could just sort of take note of the fact that uh, this uh, the images, some of the images you'll see today, you might find quite distressing. So please feel free. Uh, to to leave the room if you wish. Um, of course, we um, hope that all people stay, but but this is just a uh, sort of disclaimer, I suppose. Um, and if you don't want to appear on camera, I should remind you that the session is recorded. This is very specifically for people online, so please feel free to turn off your cameras. Um, so welcome again, and thank you, Marie. Would you like to come here? Yeah. So I'm very glad uh, to be here today to present some of the results of this uh, long-term project. So I will just uh, introduce our guest today. Um, so I will be introducing uh, some of the outcomes of my, our ongoing project on uh, slavery and forced migration uh, in um, in 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 Mali, in Western Mali, and uh, talking about how. Uh, how people attempt to escape slavery these days in Mali. Uh, then we will move to um, to uh, a talk uh, by Salufu Kamara, who is a Malian anti-slavery activist of the Gambana RMFP movement. Um, uh, we will be talking about activism against this and best slavery in West Africa and in Mali in particular. Our third guest is uh, Asa Konate Kamara, um, uh, also a Malian anti-slavery activist of the Gambana movement, and she will be talking on 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 women against slavery in Mali and the importance of the women's uh, activities and activism against slavery in Mali. And we'll finish with an online presentation by my colleague uh, Lot. Pelkmans, uh, who is also co I on this project, uh, will uh, be presenting some of her research linked to this project. So, but let's start. Uh, so this is a UKRI funding research project entitled Slavery and Forced Migration in Western Mali, SLAFMIG, which uh, 
uh, started in 2020 and it's a three year project. Um, so you can see on the screen, uh, uh, of course, Mali, but uh, more specifically, uh, the region of Kai, Western Mali, the region uh, the project is, is concerned with. So this is uh, an international project. Uh, with a team uh, based here at SOAS, uh, uh, but also in Bamako with Professor Bakai Kamara of the Law School of Bamako, Dr. Uh, uh, Lot Pelkmans at the University of Copenhagen, who is an anthropologist, uh, Moussa Kalapo, Mamadou Sensisse, and Mayam Koulibaly, who are our civil society uh, partner uh, uh, with the uh, organization Don Cosira. And uh, um, um, joining the team as well is Ilya Jadi, who is an advocacy expert. So the, 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 the objectives of the project were uh, to conduct research on forced displacement, which are a result of descent-based slavery in Western Mali. People uh, forcibly displaced internally because uh, they were um, um, uh, they were expelled from their villages or because they tried to escape uh, uh, um, 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 violence. And, and, and had no choice to survive, but to resettle elsewhere. Um, so, uh, the, that's why you have, um, this link made between uh, slavery and, and forced migration in this project. Um, so we are looking at, uh, this protracted displacement and how People once they are displaced, escaping slavery, how uh, they try to uh, rebuild their lives and to integrate in the host societies where they resettle. Um, but so that's the aspect of the research. But it's a research action project. So one part is also to advocate for uh, uh, for um, uh, concrete actions to fight against slavery in Mali, in particular, but more generally in West Africa, in the Sahel. So uh, we do advocacy for uh, the criminalization of decent-based slavery and its promulgation as a law in Mali, because until today, uh, um, well, slavery is abolished, but not criminalized in Mali. Uh, decent-based slavery is not criminalized. Um, and uh, linked to that is a series of activities we have conducted and continue to conduct it to promote intra-community dialogue, and, and peace and, and understanding of, of the situation, uh, and of the victims, uh, of this best slavery and, um, a, a broader, uh, with a raising awareness program on the issue of uh, decent based slavery to fight against immense discrimination and to uh, to uh, work for human rights. And uh, Don Cosira is our central partner to do especially activities with school children in, in Western Mali to raise awareness. So today, for example, they organize a slam competition in Kai, the main city of uh, Western Mali, um, with seven uh, high schools, uh, secondary schools, um, with uh, students to um, to uh, slam uh, on the topic of decent based slavery. Um, so that's in short what the project is about. So what is decent based slavery in Mali today? Um, we often as um, when was introducing the, the topic, we often think of uh, slavery as something of the past. We have some dates uh, of its abolition in Europe and the transatlantic uh, world. And there was even for uh, West Africa, for what used to be French West Africa, an abolition of slavery, domestic slavery in 1905. Um, but despite this abolition, uh, it didn't mean the end of the practice, which uh, adapted to this new legal environment to continue uh, um, under other forms, but still uh, in a in a in a in a violent way. So uh, many people still suffer of discrimination and violence as a result of their hereditary ascribed slave status. It's based on the fact that because they had supposedly one ancestor at some time who was enslaved, they automatically inherit this status. It's hereditary. They cannot escape it um, or not easily. Um, so until today, the descendants of the so-called enslaved, despite abolition, are still called slaves 
in some communities, um, especially in Western Mali. And this violence, it's based on stigmatization, discrimination, and our guest today will talk more specifically about that. But this, this violence can be very serious. It comes to exactions and even, even more murder. Um, and, uh, we'll talk about s such cases in a, in a moment. Uh, um, uh, and, and of course, people try when it comes to this extent of violence in, in some of these villages, they have no choice but, uh, to, to, to to escape, to, to migrate, to leave their community of origin where, where they were born very often, uh, to uh, resettle elsewhere to escape slavery. So today in Western Mali, uh, since 2018, you have more than 3,000 people who had to escape like this from one day to the other to uh, leave most of their belongings uh, in their village of origin and just trying to resettle, resettle wh wherever they can. Um, so we have been working with one of these host communities, um, the village of Mambiri, in uh, the Kita district, which is also part of the region of Western Mali, of the region of Kai. Um, and we have conducted two quantitative surveys and one qualitative survey from 2020 to 2022. Um, and in this specific village, uh, actually the, there was the incoming of uh, 1,203 people escaping slavery within three weeks in this village. They were coming from five different villages uh, locating about 150 kilometers north of Mambiri. And within three weeks, they resettled in this small village. So the, the population doubled within three weeks in, 2000, in January 2019. Um, so for the first quantitative surveys, we've interviewed 100 women and 100 men who had been falsely displaced, escaping slavery, to know about the kind of violence they, they experienced. And for the second quantitative survey, we interviewed both uh, host populations and escapees and uh, displaced once about 400 people in total to try to understand the kind of social dynamic and the kind of integration that was a socioeconomic survey. And we also did in qualitative interviews in Bambiri. So, um, um, so in Bambiri, you have a population of 2,700 83 inhabitants, uh, uh, of which 136 households. And out of this 136 households, today you have 31 who were displaced and uh, adding up to the existing population. That is 1,203 people. Uh, that is 43% of the population today. Um, um, seven, Seven, uh, um, seventy-three percent of uh, these family aids uh, are involved in agriculture, and twenty-seven percent in livestock farming, uh, which is a main uh, or secondary activity. Uh, so, obviously, in such situation where people are mostly in agriculture, of course, what becomes crucial is access to land, and and. Um, and in a situation in in an environment which is uh, quite vulnerable to uh, climate hazards, um, so it has also, of course, pressure on land land access and survival. So when we conduct this uh, quantitative survey about the uh, kind of violence that um, uh, this population displaced, falsely displaced population experience. Um, uh, we, we calculated that, uh, 85% of the displaced interviewees in Mainbiri had experienced violence or, and or deprivation, um, in their village of origin. It ranges from insult, uh, threat to, uh, physical abuse, uh, but also deprivation of, uh, of, uh, healthcare, education, um, uh, food and, and other kind of, um, of deprivation. Um, uh, sorry, my, my tables and, uh, are mostly in French, but, uh, 
I, I will explain them in English anyway. So just uh, just illustrative. Um, among um, uh, among the households who have access to land, displaced households have on average much less land available for cultivation, less than three hectares on average per household, uh, compared with for indigenous households, almost nine hectares um, on average per household. So, and, but what is also important to uh, keep in mind is that the displaced households are uh, very often much larger um, they are composed of many more people than the indigenous population in, in Mambiri. Um, it's important in that, uh, within this framework, not only to consider the average number of hectares per household, but also the number of hectares per, per adult. Uh, we have, um, if we consider that at least one hectare is needed for approximately uh, two adults to be able to gain a sufficient subsistence level. That means a kind of threshold below which households do not have enough land to earn sufficient subsistence. Uh, actually, among the displaced households, it's only four of the 20, uh, 23 who are in a, in a case where they are able to gain a sufficient subsistence level. While compared with the local population, the original, uh, the, the native population of Mambiri, it's 62 to 72. So it, they are, um, uh, obviously in the displaced population are in a far more vulnerable population uh, situation when it comes to access to land. Um, uh, but still, uh, there has been a strong commitment from the villager of Mambiri to give land and, and, uh, or rent land to the incoming displaced population. Um, and this is to praise here how much generous, uh, they have been, um, to host these populations, these incoming populations. As I said, they arrived within three weeks with not uh, hardly anything. So they had to rebuild their, their life. Um, uh, but still access to land, despite this great generosity, access to land remains insufficient. And when it comes to even the community garden, uh, which is very popular with Mamberi's women, um, its surface uh, is still insufficient for everyone to have a plot. Only 8% of the displaced women have access to it. So, um, so these are just a few figures to introduce the situation of, for the host communities and, and the displaced populations, what, what kind of issues and difficulties they are faced with. And um, those it, uh, that's here, uh, my, my, my final slide. Um, what are the issues at stake here? Um, discrimination and violence linked to decent based slavery leads, as I've, I've shown, uh, to forced displacement. We generate pressure on land in the in the host villages and on, but also on infrastructure. I highlighted the land tenure aspect, but there are many other pressures like access to uh, healthcare and to schools. I just got a message from Mambiri this morning, uh, telling me that uh, there are too many school children in. Uh, due also to these incoming populations uh, in the school and, and uh, the village is not able to uh, pay for enough um, uh, school teachers. Um, so these displacements are long lasting and pose real development sh challenges because these populations are in Mambiri to stay. They have already started building um, um, uh, their houses in concrete uh, and cement. So uh, 91 percent of the displaced persons interviewed declared that they had no intention of ever returning to their village of origin. So uh, it's about how uh, these communities, these host communities. I mean, I I, I chose the only the, the example of Mindberry because it's where we've conducted uh, detailed research and, and interviews, but actually um, these uh, issues uh, 
are also at stake in other art communities confronted with, with the same situation. Um, and even beyond the risk of conflict around land tenure, um, this pressure on local resources makes the village more vulnerable, uh, including to terrorist groups. Uh, actually, there was a couple of months ago an attack. I mean, Mambiri is at the border with a forest and, the, and the, there was a forest post, official forest post, uh, outside of Mambiri and it was attacked by, uh, we don't know, terrorist bandits, whatever. But just to say, um, that, uh, the risk of terrorist groups or band and bandits, um, are here and they can exploit, of course, the vulnerability, uh, the social vulnerabilities of, of these villages, despite all the generosity of the host population. Uh, if there are increased tensions around um, natural resources, of course, um, they, they become uh, more vulnerable to any kind of manipulation. Um, so I will just uh, stop here and uh, we'll invite um, Salut, Camara. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Salufulaji Kamara. I am vice president of the organization anti-slavery uh, RMP Gambana Mali. Uh, je voudrais bien continuer en anglais, mais malheureusement, j'ai des difficultés pour uh, continuer. I would have liked to carry on in English, but unfortunately, it's going to be difficult for me. Alors, je suis là aujourd'hui pour vous parler de notre mouvement qu'on appelle Gambana. So, I am here today to talk to you about our movement, uh, which is called Gambana. Gambana veut dire euh, Angelette Soninke, euh, égalité en dignité, en devoir. Et égalité en, 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 de, en égalité en droit et en devoir. So in Soninke, Gambana means equality in rights, in duty and in dignity. Et ce mouvement d'émancipation nous est venu de la Mauritanie. This movement of emancipation came from Mauritania. Et quand c'est arrivé au niveau du Mali, nous avons créé notre organisation qu'on appelle RMP, Rassemblement Malien pour la Fraternité et le Progrès. And when it came to Mali, we created our own organization, which is called the RMFP. So they, this is a Malian rally for brotherhood and progress. Une autre organisation a été créée le 1er avril 2017. It was created on the 1st of April 2017. Avant la création de cette organisation et l'arrivée du mouvement Gambana, il y avait des révoltes des esclaves. Before the creation of this uh, this organization and before the Gambana movement, there were some resistance and the revolts among slaves. Et ces révoltes étaient faites d'une façon isolée, étaient étouffées euh, par des répressions sanglantes. But this These resistance were isolated and were repressed uh, bloodily. Et le réseau WhatsApp nous a permis de nous regrouper et de lutter ensemble. So the WhatsApp uh, network allowed people to meet together and to work together against slavery. Et l'arrivée de WhatsApp nous a permis de nous mobiliser et on a vu l'adhésion de plusieurs euh, esclaves dans le mouvement Gambana. So it, it helped us to mobilize and we've seen many people assigned with their status join the Gambana movement. Et compte tenu de l'ampleur des adhésions des esclaves, euh, des, des descendants d'esclaves dans le mouvement Gambana. Regarding the uh, increasing of the adhesion to Gambana among the people assigned with slave status. Et ce, nous avons eu la réponse des esclavagistes que par des répressions sanglantes. The slavers responded uh, always with violence. Et ces répressions sont allées jusqu'à à des assassinats. It, it came to assassination. Aujourd'hui, nous avons euh, plus de 6722 
membre actif de notre mouvement. Today there is more than 6722 active members in Gambana uh, in et, the RMFP. Et plus de 11000 membres euh, et sympathisants de Gambana RMFP Mali. And so in Mali there there is an estimation that there is more than uh, 11000 uh, members and supporters of the Gambana movement. Et compte tenu de l'ampleur que ce mouvement a pris, euh, la même chose est advenue par des, des violences euh, physiques, corporelles et, et tout ce qui suit. So this increasing in activism against anti-slavery activism was responded with violence and physical uh, aggressions. Et ces agressions sont le lynchage public les bastonnades, les privations de tout genre pour les biens euh, communs, comme l'eau potable, le, la santé, et j'en passe. These violences included physical aggressions like public lynching, beatings, and also restrictions, uh, notably on public goods, for example, water of health, health care, and so on. L'interdiction d'accès aux terres agricoles. Uh, it was a restriction on the access to land. Et comme si cela ne suffisait pas, ils ont maintenant décidé de chasser uh, les descendants d'esclaves de leur maison et de leur village. And because it was not sufficient, uh, they decided to chase people away from their villages and homes. Et plus de 3000 uh, réfugiés sont au niveau du Mali à l'intérieur des villes où ils ont été chassés de, à l'intérieur des villes et parce qu'ils ont été chassés de leur village. And that's how we came with um, 3,000 refugees uh, inside Mali because they were chased from their villages. La plupart des, des gens chassés des maisons et des villages sont des femmes et des enfants à hauteur de 76%. Most of these people are children and women uh, up to 76%. Et jusqu'à présent, nous sommes en charge de nos réfugiés qui sont plus de 3000 personnes euh, à l'intérieur du pays. And so the, the movement has partly taken up in charge these refugees inside the country. Et c'est les esclavagistes ont importé partout où ils vont à travers le monde le système d'esclavage par ascendance. Slavers so export uh, those uh, slavery practices wherever they go in the world. En Europe, et notamment en France, euh, dans les foyers des travailleurs et dans les appartements, les, es- les descendants d'esclaves sont obligés de faire des travaux domestiques, euh, de, 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 du ménage et, et des courses et sont à la disposition de leurs maîtres, même au niveau européen. So, even in Europe, in France, Um, some slavers uh, force people to work for them without being paid. So, for example, for uh, the household chores, um, cleaning, shopping, cooking, and all of this without being paid. Et même le, le même les les jeunes qui dans les ces deux communautés euh, ont interdiction de se marier entre eux, même s'ils s'aiment. And people of these two communities are forbidden to get married even if they're in love. Nous avons enregistré au niveau de la France euh, six annulations de fiançailles. For example, in the diaspora in France, we registered six uh, engagement cancellation because of slavery. Et nous, certains mariages ont pu aboutir grâce à la, euh, à la détermination euh, des fiancés eux-mêmes et à l'appui de l'association. Some marriage uh, still carry on thanks to the determination of the engaged people themselves and of the support of the association. En revenant au Mali, nous allons euh, vous dire que dans la nuit du 1er au, euh, au 2 septembre 2000, 2020, euh, quatre chefs, chefs de famille ont été froidement assassinés sous le regard de leurs femmes et enfants. Coming back into Mali, for example, in 2020, 
four people were, four fathers were, were murdered under the eyes of their wives and children. Le seul tort de ce père de famille était de refuser le statut de d'esclave par ascendance. The only reason they were murdered was because they refused the status of the slave status. Et nous avons aussi des difficultés avec euh, les autorités euh, de l'État et religieuses. We also encountered uh, difficulties with the state and religious authorities. Parce qu'au début de notre mouvement, nous avons rencontré un déni généralisé de part et d'autre. Indeed, at the beginning of the movement, um, we encountered a generalized denial from any part. Aucune autorité n'admettait que l'esclavage par ascendance existait au Mali. No authority um, wanted to admit that uh, sla uh, descendant slavery was a reality in Mali. Et à ch devant chaque violence subie par nos membres, nous portons plainte systématiquement. Each violence which is committed uh, against all members, we filed a legal complaint. Et ces plaintes sont restées en stand-by dans les juridictions euh, jusqu'à présent. But most, most of this uh, complaints remained without results uh, until now. Nous nous résistons aujourd'hui que euh, grâce à euh, la mobilisation, euh, que ce soit euh, des ONG, la mobilisation de notre association, euh, le gouvernement malien commence à prendre le, la vraie ampleur du phénomène d'esclavage par ascendance. So we happy now to see that thanks to the efforts of NGOs, of all movements, uh, the Malian government began to understand the, um, the stakes and to take the measure of the phenomenon of descendant slavery. Et c'est ici le lieu de remercier euh, les acteurs euh, d'Emiflow SOS euh, de Londres et dirigé par euh, le docteur Marie Rodet, qui, qui ont ménagé, qui n'ont pas ménagé les efforts pour euh, expliquer la problématique du, du, du phénomène d'esclavage par ascendance. And here I would like to, to thank the, um, the Slavmic Project and the SOAS University and all the actors of the Slavmic Project, especially um, Dr. Marie Rodet, that led it. Uh, for their help for it, because uh, it was really important to get people to understand uh, the phenomenon of descendant slavery. La sensibilisation produite par leur projet en tenant des conférences, des ateliers et des plaidoyers a contribué très fortement à la compréhension de la problématique du phénomène d'esclavage par ascendance. The conferences, workshops, and advocacy activities really helped to raise awareness around this issue. Et aujourd'hui, nous nous réjouissons que le gouvernement du Mali a pris la pleine ampleur de, du phénomène de l'esclavage par ascendance en promettant une loi criminalisant ce phénomène. And thanks to all this, we're happy to see that the Malian government had begun to Uh, consider the adoption of a law criminalizing uh, descendant slavery at last. Et je voudrais bien continuer pour énumérer beaucoup, beaucoup de choses, mais compte tenu du temps imparti, euh, je vous remercie. And I, I would like to, to continue to carry on because I have so many things to say, but given the, the time, I'm going to leave you with that and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Je m'appelle Asa Konate. My name is Asa Konate. Je suis la secrétaire générale de la section des femmes RMFP, Rassemblement Malien pour la Fraternité et le Progrès. I am the General Secretary of the Women's Section of the RMFP, so the Malian Rally for Brotherhood and Progress. Je remercie les organisateurs de cette conférence de nous avoir invités à cet événement. I thank the organizer of this conference for inviting us to this event. C'est pour nous une opportunité de vous parler de l'esclavagisme par ascendance et de ses conséquences sur les femmes. It is an opportunity for us to talk to you about this slavery and its consequences on women. 
L'esclavage par ascendance est une réalité en Afrique de l'Ouest. Descent-based slavery is a reality in West Africa. C'est une réalité qui nous vivons dans notre chair. It is a reality that we experience in our flesh. Le 29 juillet 20, 2022, ma tante Biogula Gisidibé a été assassinée sauvagement à l'âge de 71 ans par des esclavagistes dans l'ouest du Mali, car elle les tenait, osait tenir tête. On the 29 July um, 2022, my aunt Jogu CBJ was savagely murdered at the age of 71 by slavers in western Mali because she dared to stand up to them. L'histoire a commencé trois, avant, trois ans avant sa mort, quand son fils est venu au village avec un tricot de gambana. The story began three years before her death, when her son returned to the village with a gambana t-shirt. Les esclavagistes soi-disant nobles ont voulu lui interdire de porter ce tricot et ont fait venir sa mère pour lui soumettre. Elle a répondu qu'elle soutenait totalement son fils. The slavers, also called nobles, wanted to forbid him to wear uh, this t-shirt and they called uh, his mother to subdue him. She replied that she fully supported her son. En représailles, ils lui ont interdit d'accéder au champ qu'elle cultivait depuis toujours. Elle a porté plainte et a gagné son procès, qui lui a donné un titre de propriété sur ses champs. In retaliation, they forbid her access to the field that she had always cultivated. She filed a complaint and won her case, which gave her ownership on the field. Mais les esclavagistes sont venus une première fois en 2021 l'agresser pendant qu'elle travaillait dans son champ. But the, the slavers first came to attack her in 2021 while she was working there. En mai 2022, ils l'ont encore agressée, ils l'ont frappée, blessée au front avec un ou, et ils l'ont dit de apporter son lancel la prochaine fois qu'il viendra travailler dans son champ. In May 2022, they assaulted her again. They hit her, wounded her in the forehead and told her to bring her shirt the next time she came to walk on the field. Le 29 juillet 2022, ils ont mis leur menace à exécution. On the 29th of July 2022, they carried out their threats. Alors qu'elle était dans son, qu'elle était en train de travailler dans son champ, on l'a gazée, traînée et assassinée. While she was working in a field, they gazed, dragged and murdered her. Ils ont découpé son corps en morceaux et ont essayé de le brûler. They cut her body into pieces and tried to burn it. Et quand le feu n'a pas pris, ils l'ont mis dans un sac, son corps dans un sac qu'il a jeté dans la mare, dans le marigot. When the fire didn't burn, they put her body in a bag and threw it into a swamp. Son corps sans vie a été retrouvé le lendemain. Her lifeless body was found the next day. L'histoire de ma tante, ce n'est qu'un cas extrême, mais ce n'est pas un cas isolé. De manière générale, les femmes avec les enfants sont principalement les victimes de l'esclavage. My own story is an extreme case, but it is not an isolated case. In general, women, along with children, are the main victims of descent-based slavery. En tant que femme du mouvement, je souhaite en particulier porter la voix des femmes dans la lutte contre l'esclavage en Afrique. As a woman is a movement, I particularly want to bring the voice of women in the fight against slavery in Africa. Tous les enfants d'une femme considérée comme esclave seront tout systématiquement assignés au statut d'esclave. So women are victims of specific violence. All children of a woman considered a slave will systematically be considered slaves themselves. Dans certains villages où il y a une catégorie d'esclaves qui est appartient à l'ensemble du village, les femmes dites esclaves sont à la disposition sexuelle des hommes nobles. In some villages where there is a category of slaves that belongs to the whole village, the women considered as slaves are at the sexual disposal of the nobles. Si une femme est descendant d'esclaves et mariée, 
le maître ne acceptera jamais ce mariage et va continuer à disposer sexuellement de cette femme. If a woman considered the slave is married, the master will not respect this marriage and will continue to dispose of this woman sexually. Les femmes, notamment les jeunes filles, sont forcées de, de faire les travaux domestiques pour les femmes nobles, piler le mille, faire le linge, le balayage, puiser d'eau, etc. Women, especially young girls, are forced to do the domestic work for the noble women, plundering millets, doing the laundry, sweeping, drawing water, etc. Après l'assassinat de ma tante, les adhésions de Gambana ont explosé parce que les ce sont les femmes les plus victimes de ce de ce pratique. After my aunt was murdered, Gambana membership exploded Big, uh, because women are the biggest victim of this project. Elles sont autant engagées dans la lutte au sein de Gambana. So they are also more committed to the struggle. Ce sont les femmes qui sont les plus actives sur les euh, groupes d'échange et les réseaux sociaux. Within the Gambanas, uh, this is the women who are most active in the exchange group on social media. Elles témoignent sur, sur le WhatsApp des violences qu'elles ont subies. Il y a des groupes pour réservé pour les femmes. They talk about the violence they suffer on WhatsApp and there are groups specifically for women. Elles sont les plus nombreuses dans les manifestants, les manifestations au Mali comme dans la diaspora. They are the most numerous in the demonstration in Mali and in the diaspora. Ce sont elles qui collectent l'argent pour soutenir les victimes et les activités du mouvement. They are the ones who collect money to support the victims and the activities of the movement. C'est vous dire à quel point les femmes sont pleinement engagées dans la lutte contre l'esclavage en Afrique et au Mali. So all this shows how fully committed women are to the fight against descent-based slavery in West Africa and in Mali. Je vous remercie. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we will now move to uh, an online presentation by uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Lot Pelkmans. Um, so I might be saying some things that have already been said, but then uh, I'll try to go quickly over them. And I really would like to focus a bit tonight on the role of social media in uh, this anti-slavery activism, which is actually quite transnational as I will demonstrate here. And this uh, fits in a longer standing research I've been doing on uh, West African slavery movements. So the people of the movement you saw tonight, Hassa and uh, Mr. Salifu, Salifu, they are uh, part of the Gambana movements, more specifically the Malian branch, but uh, the movement I've been studying more generally is called Gambana Hufede. As you can see here, it uh, regroups four countries. But my uh, fieldwork has been mainly with uh, people uh, in France, mainly based in Paris, like Asa and Saifu, the two people just talking to you. They also live in France, in Paris. Uh, and I've been talking to people mainly from Mauritania and Mali. Um, and the role of social media, I think uh, Mr. Salufu also already mentioned it, uh, the role of WhatsApp is quite uh, important. And um, compared to the other movements I've been studying over the past 10 years, it clearly uh, also contributed a lot to the success and the very quick um, mobilization that this movement was able to make. And of course, it also resulted in polarization and violent conflicts. I'm making a documentary movie, movie, both on the movement itself and on the role of women. And unfortunately, it's not ready yet, so I can't uh, show you anything of it tonight. Happy to do so later. Uh, it's been mentioned, so I hope you are all uh, understanding what decent-based slavery is about. Um, maybe just uh, underlining one issue, um, namely that the socio-political and economic power remained with freeborn elites today, or so-called freeborn or noble uh, elites, so the people who used to enslave uh, people in the past uh, and still consider themselves owners. Um, and uh, we are not in a transatlantic nor a 
explicitly racialized, racialized context. So uh, it's rather through purity of blood than through skin color that uh, statuses and uh, positions are being. Um, so there is a uh, big uh, transnational activism going on within this movement, the Gambana movement, Gambana meaning equality. Uh, the network, uh, as I mentioned, is between four countries. And you can see here in this scheme made by one of my students, it's not complete, but it gives you an idea of the Mauritanian network, the green one, the Malian network, the blue one, and the Senegalese and Gambian networks, and, and the different branches they have. They have a youth part, they have, uh, sometimes they are allied with other anti-slavery movements as well. They fight for equality and rights and dignity. And so, um, as has been mentioned as well, uh, there's been a lot of um, focus on uh, getting a law passed, criminalizing decent-based slavery. Um, that's especially in Mali still a problem, but even in the countries where such laws exist, such as in Mauritania, their application remains complicated because governments and people in high positions are often also uh, descendants of former enslavers or former uh, nobility. And so they are the power holders and they are not willing to let their privileges go. Um, more specifically for the Soninke uh, and this Gambana movement is the fact that they have a very vast diaspora around the world. Uh, I mentioned that I worked in Paris, France, where there's probably one of the biggest uh, parts of this diaspora. And in, uh, Paris is sometimes also called, at least for the Malian part, Bamako-sur-Seine. So it's the second biggest village or city uh, with Malian Soninke uh, in the world after uh, Bamako in Mali itself. Uh, so the diaspora plays a big role. Um, and this has been made possible, of course, through social media. What are they doing? What are the activities about? And what uh, are they contesting? Well, as I show here on the slide, so they have actually a double mission internally among um, the Soninke communities themselves. Uh, they have to kind of fight against the idea that decent-based slavery is a custom, a lada, which is the Soninke word, it's a kind of a social contract that has to be respected and maintained. And it's a historical relation that shouldn't be just uh, given up, according to, of course, those people benefiting from it. Uh, so that's uh, the internal mission. They have to um, manage to cross new messages about this. The second one is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the international community, because decent-based slavery is something that is rather uh, unknown for many people, difficult to understand, not always straightforward. There are very many different regional variations. In some regions, uh, the legacies are not as strong as in others. It's even very different from one family and one small village to the other. So in some villages, also with the current activism, we see that there's a lot of incidents, while in others there is much less. And that's because in some villages there are uh, more peaceful and less trained, uh, polarized uh, relations. So that's part of what they um, have to fight against. I don't know in view of time if I am allowed to show a one minute small excerpt of a reportage, um, uh, but I'll go on to say something uh, about this activism via social media. It's really thanks to the arrival of WhatsApp that um, the movement, which actually has a long history in many ways, uh, Salifu also mentioned that it's mainly started in, in Mauritania and then more specifically in the Mauritanian diaspora and also uh, in Mauritania itself. But um, the thing is that uh, even though there were voices protesting and trying to go against existing di discriminations, it's really the fact that everyone started to have phones, phone connections, uh, and access to groups, WhatsApp groups, that kind of started to create this new collective identity, almost you could say, whereby people started to understand, okay, this is not just happening in our village. This is not just a problem we are facing 
as a family or as individuals, this is something big and it's actually not okay. And so uh, the fact that uh, WhatsApp, on top of just being a social media that is quite accessible, easy to download, not too heavy for uh, low quality phones, uh, um, it's also a very good media because we are talking here about uh, societies, I just gave a comparative figure here, um, where uh, especially Mali and especially, by the way, the Western part of Mali has a very low literacy rate, as you can see here, 36 percent. This is a figure from 2018 and, of course, for what figures are worth. But it says something about how few people can uh, write and read, but WhatsApp allows, uh, as opposed to other social media, actually allows to do the voice messages, the oral messages, which makes that, and it of course has the visual function, but other social media do have that as well. So it really allows for people to um, exchange without necessarily uh, needing to be able to read. Um, and on top of that, of course, WhatsApp is quite a well-protected media, which also turns out to be a good thing in view of the current tensions uh, of activists vis-a-vis vis vis their opponents. So um, the network and or the fora, as they are called within the movement, they are organized in groups. And I didn't know anything <laughs> about the exact technical details of WhatsApp, but it turns out that each, if you make a group, it can be max two 56 persons and uh, per country this slide or this scheme you see here it's for uh, Mauritania and as you can see uh, all the way below the forum consists of 20 of such groups uh, but apart from those bigger groups you also have village groups and you also have diaspora groups often communicating or not often but also communicating in French for example there's this one group called ICI ailleurs um, and so all these groups uh, make people come in. And when Mr. Salufu mentioned before that they have 6,700 members, that's mostly the paying members, but the active members on WhatsApp, I'm not sure if there are uh, official figures currently, but this goes way beyond. And it also connects people sitting in Gabon, in China, in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Paris, uh, all following uh, what's being posted there. And so what you also get is a kind of very, without, by the way, uh, making a too positive message about this, because there's also uh, constraints and, of course, negative sides. But a small uh, peasant in a small village can post a message online saying, I've been attacked this morning, and then the mes message immediately travels the world. So that's really uh, helped the movement to gain in a very short time span, because as you heard, 2017 was the first setup of the movement, so to speak, of course, with some historical precedents, but not really an, an official movement. And in the meantime, it has become in any village where you say the word Gambana, people will know what it's about. And even in the national scene of Mali, people will know what this movement is about. So they really had an impact that none of the other movements that I've been looking into managed to make for good and for bad, because of course this also contributed to the polarization of the debate. And you, in the meantime, people can only be in favor uh, or very much in favor of uh, Gambana or totally against and kind of the middle ground positions have kind of uh, vanished, or at least it's very difficult uh, for people to try to moderate in this uh, activist field. So the fora, they are, they're very big, they're very many, and so especially I've been working with some of the people who are high up in the movement, the secretary generals, the vice presidents, like Mr. Camera, uh, and they receive on a daily basis hundreds of messages, and so some of them are literally totally overwhelmed and constantly online trying to follow, trying to filter and trying to then also coordinate what to do with some messages that are really about incidents that need action. So yeah, this is an enormous work and this kind of hyper connectivity of course also generates 
uh, its challenges. Apart from WhatsApp, there's of course also Facebook groups uh, and there has even been, uh, Gambana had its own radio channel. They even had their own uh, online uh, journal or news uh, edition. They didn't have money to continue that, but that's, and then they have merchandising. And as I mentioned, currently Gambana is just, at least for people at Herring, it's something really cool and it, it, it really gained an image uh, a lot of artists are uh, making songs about Gambana. I just went to Senegal and spoke with a girl who actually got beaten because she was listening to one of those Gambana songs uh, by the person who uh, hired her. So the movement really in so many ways uh, managed to make itself physical, uh, not only vis-a-vis -vis the outside world, but mainly also among people that before never really spoke to each other and maybe didn't realize that uh, they were sharing a condition of discrimination that was not supposed to stay on. So because I only have 10 minutes, I'll stop here uh, and just try to wrap up again saying that uh, social media has been really important to amplify voices that before stood alone and maybe one more example people also shared uh, histories so people speaking about how one of their sisters in the past has been murdered because she did something very minor a uh, small thing uh, wrong and uh, so you get this kind of archiving also of stories of exploitation, of discrimination, and of difficulties people encountered. And it's the first time also that people want to talk about it because for a long time it has been so taboo and so stigmatizing to have this identity, to have undergone this kind of humiliations, if you want, and it has been too shameful to even address. And now people start to talk about it and also start to communicate with their children and um, across the generations. And I think that's a very important and probably good thing um, because it really uh, makes this kind of counter stigma uh, possible whereby people start to take pride in who they are and start to understand where they come from and really try to change the, the, the association with their identity, so to speak. Um, so it was really a taboo issue, especially, by the way, in Soninke societies. I've been working on decent slavery in West Africa for quite a while, and it was quite well known to be an issue in uh, Tamashek or Tuareg societies or among the Moors uh, and so forth and so on. But Soninke never, ever was there any big mention of this being a contemporary issue. Uh, so it was very much taboo to speak about it. And as I think Hassa also mentioned, uh, especially abuse vis-a-vis uh, -vis women, sexual abu abuse, children being born, not having a father because of the abuse and then become bastard kids that then uh, in turn also became very vulnerable to exploitation because they had, don't have fathers to protect them. So this vicious circle uh, now might at least the movements uh, made that these issues have been openly put on the table and uh, that they have been amplified and vis visualized. Um, yeah, so I think I'll uh, keep it here and thank you for your attention. Looking forward to the discussion. Interesting set of presentations and papers. So, and thank you also for keeping to time. So, uh, so well um uh, we have plenty of time we've got uh, about 50 minutes for discussion and questions uh we have a, quite a substantial online audience but can i open the floor to discussion and uh questions yes please go ahead if you if i could ask you if you if you don't mind identifying yourself yes. um please or if, if all people asking questions could identify themselves yeah I, thank you. My name is Peter Cheney. I'm from Northern Ireland. Um, I, I, I was involved in a project supporting the Great Green Wall pro project a few years back. And I just wondered how helpful is the Great Green Wall in tackling slavery? 
Ok, so, so, um... <rire> pardon. Donc la question, c'est à propos de la Grande Muraille Verte et de, il a été impliqué donc dans ce projet-là. Donc est-ce que euh, la grand... le projet de la Grande Muraille Verte a une importance, a un impact sur la lutte euh, contre l'esclavage et si oui, lequel? Euh, euh, Est-ce que vous avez entendu parler de la Grande Muraille Verte? Uh, okay, my colleagues here have never heard of this project. Uh, and I believe, I suspect that a lot of populations in West Africa have never heard of this project in practice. So I'm afraid I don't see where there might have been some impact here on against slavery. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Samba Jalo. I'm uh, a member of the movement Gambanaru. I would like to express in, in French to ask uh, some questions to the president. Uh, bonsoir, M. Kamara. Bonsoir. Je suis un membre du mouvement Gambanaru. Je suis originaire mauritanien. Samba Jalo résident ici à Londres depuis uh, presque huit ans. Oui, J'ai entendu parler. Oui. Juste une petite question par rapport à nos détracteurs qui nous disent euh, on est ici en Occident, dans nos salons climatisés, loin de la réalité. Et ceux qui sont sur le terrain, ce sont eux qui payent les prix. Par exemple, on a parlé des assassinats au Mali. Heureusement, en Mauritanie, ce n'est pas encore arrivé là-bas, mais il y a des, des oppressions, il y a des opprimés en Mauritanie aussi. Pour moi, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas une autre alternative ou d'autres moyens, c'est-à-dire, je vais vous, je vous parler d'une manière de, 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 de défensive, quoi. Au lieu de dire, oui, nous, on est là, on veut une, une, une vite passive. Pourquoi ne pas opter pour d'autres moyens? Parce qu'on a vu toujours, c'est l'oppresseur qui définit la situation. Et quand on, quand on voit nos détracteurs qui sont des esclavagistes, des féodaux, entre guillemets, comme moi je les appelle des, des esclavagistes, qui ne veulent pas lâcher l'affaire, qu'ils ont assassiné, chassé les gens de ces opprimés depuis des années, comme vous avez dit dans, dans votre discours, qu'il y a eu des années, il y a des personnes qui ont, qui, qui ont, qui ont commencé cette, cette, cette lutte avant nous, mais ils n'ont rien abouti. Est-ce qu'il n'est pas, pas le temps? De, 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 de penser autrement. Je vous remercie. Uh, do you want to ask a question in English as well, or shall we translate for? Okay, so the answer here is a member of the Gambanatu from Mauritania. So, um, it was. I'm talking about some people, uh, some opponents that are saying that, uh, in fact, it's too easy to to be on the Europe side and to to discuss these issues in protected areas uh, far from the reality. Um, but he wanted to stress uh, the need to think um, another way because the slavers always impose their visions of things and the vision of who has good, who has bad, and whose fault it is. And that it is no time to change the mentalities and because they came to any extremities, even murder, as we say here. Uh, did I understood correctly what... Yeah, yeah, just what, what I want to say. That, okay. You know, we are uh, far away from the reality. People... Yeah. Uh, like I said, hein, because uh, as you know, bon, je, je suis désolé, vous ne parlez pas l'anglais. Oui, oui. Et comme vous le savez, que là-bas, ceux qui sont là-bas, en, en fait, c'est surtout la traduction pour oh. ceux qui sont en ligne et dans oh, okay. la. Okay. Sorry. Ouais. Just to what, I, 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 what I want to say is, it's time for us as a member of Movement Gambanaou to, to change the things. But, but by any means necessary, this is what I'm trying to say. We can't be here just talking, you know, on WhatsApp, in social media. So we have to, we have to think about different things. En fait, Thank il, you. Il, il reformule la question en anglais, mais euh, il dit, euh, voilà, est-ce qu'il ne faut pas réfléchir à d'autres moyens 
pour la lutte parce que et on continue. Ah, oui, voilà, c'est ça. Il voulait, il voulait pas le dire, mais il l'a dit finalement. On avait compris. Est-ce qu'il faut pas passer à la lutte armée? Non. Oui. So, bon. The, the fundamental question here is whether we should uh, resort to uh, to the to fighting uh, uh, battle to violence against the oppressors. Alors, euh, merci beaucoup, euh, frère de Gamanaro Moritani. Gamanaro veut dire euh, on est les mêmes, on est égaux. Euh, voilà, j'ai compris votre question, et même si vous avez voulu euh, euh, la formuler autrement. Donc, ce que je veux vous dire, nous avons été depuis au début, et quand les violences ont atteint un certain niveau, on a été poussé, on a été entraîné pour justement changer le, 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 la façon de lutter et surtout nous-mêmes nous verser vers la violence. Et c'est ce que nous avons toujours refusé. So, um, when uh, the repression came from say, come slavers with violence, there was really um, a will to push uh, the gambanas to violence. And that's why they always refused to do, to take arms against the slavers. Nous ne pouvons pas accepter euh, de faire une lutte armée pour quelques raisons. La principale est que nous sommes des minorités dans les villages et dans les villes. So, so the first reason why the, we can't accept Uh, an armed fight is that we are minorities in the villages in general. Et si je vous donne, par exemple, l'exemple de mon propre village, if I take the example of my own village, et quand les esclavagistes ont attaqué nos familles, il y a sept familles euh, dans le village, dans mon village, euh, dans la région de Caille, euh, Lani, il y a sept familles euh, anti-esclavagistes qui étaient là, qui ont été attaqués le 5 avril 2020. So, in my village, in the Kai region, in Lani, there were seven families, anti-slavery activists, that were attacked um, in, two, in 2020. Et l'objectif était d'éliminer ces sept familles de mon village. And the, their objective, the objective of the slavers was to Eliminate the, these families from the village. Et rapidement, nous avons pu obtenir euh, euh, l'arrivée de, de, la, de la force publique pour s'interposer. But quickly, we could, um, we were able to to find the support of the public force uh, to, uh, to fight pacifically. Et c'est c'est pourquoi aujourd'hui ces familles résident toujours dans mon village. Et en paix. And that's the only reason why these families can now be in their villages in peace. Et le, la politique de ne pas faire du coup sur coup. The, the politique to not answer uh, to violence by violence. Et cela a fait valoir comme quoi la violence n'est que d'un seul côté, c'est-à-dire du côté oppresseur. As a lowest shows that the violence was only on one side, the side of the slavers. Et c'est pourquoi aujourd'hui le gouvernement est de notre côté en train de 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 sévir contre les oppresseurs. And that's why the government is now in our favor. There was, there was a change in the government, and that we are the ones that are supposed to support it. Pour euh, illustrer mon propos, c'est-à-dire que il existait plus d'une trentaine au niveau du Mali, plus d'une trentaine de groupes WhatsApp. So in Mali, there were more than 30 WhatsApp groups qui appelaient euh, à la violence. That, uh, that they used to call to arms. Et c'est des groupes esclavagistes. And this was uh, slavers group. Et ils ont tous disparu aujourd'hui. And now they have all disappeared. Parce qu'ils ont été pointés du doigt. Because they were um, exposed as the valiant one. Merci. 
Can I perhaps ask a question? Uh, if you could, uh, for those of us who don't know the Soviet area particularly well, I wonder if you could say something about the slavers and who these people are and what their identities are. Um, and I, I had another sort of historian's question, <laughs> which is if you could say something about the relationship between the form of slavery that you were describing and earlier historical forms of slavery and if there are any sort of continuities and differences. Donc, la question concerne les esclavagistes. Donc, est-ce que vous pourriez parler du, de leur profil, en fait, qui sont ces personnes Et une question d'historien, euh, donc, quels sont les liens entre la forme d'esclavage contemporaine dont vont nous parler aujourd'hui et, euh, et le, le passé Donc, euh... savoir s'il y a des continuités ou des discontinuités. La première, c'est savoir qui sont ces esclavagistes. En fait, les, euh, les esclavagistes sont euh, des gens comme nous tous. So the slavers are like any other of us. Il n'y a pas d'étiquette, euh, voilà, on ne peut pas voir tout de suite en voyant quelqu'un en disant que lui, c'est un esclavagiste. There is no way to distinguish him from another person without. Le, ce phénomène sort simplement des origines de chacun. This phenomenon is only uh, based on the origins of anyone. Et quand on parle d'esclavage, au niveau européen, on n'était pas très euh, compris. So, when we, when we talk about uh, disembodied slavery, in, in Europe, we are not really understood. Parce que le, le, quand on parle d'esclavage, les gens le, le, se remémorent le passé, ils le mettent dans le contexte du passé. Because um, when we talk about slavery, especially in Europe, people um, put it in the past and can, um, seek to, contextual, to contextualize it as only a thing of the past. L'esclavage par ascendance euh, qui existe au niveau du, de l'Afrique, c'est un esclavage aussi d'antan. So, um, this in slavery in Africa is also something that has its roots in the past. Et l'esclavage anciennement connu, c'est l'esclavage où les gens étaient euh, arrêtés, enchaînés, ainsi de suite, et cela, la communauté internationale a pu mettre fin à, ces, à, à, ce, à ce phénomène d'esclavage. And so, before, the slavery was based on uh, capture of people, kidnapping of people that were arrested, attached, displaced, And now the international community could end this part of, sal of slavery. Et ceux qui n'ont pas pu arrêter, c'est l'existence de l'esclavage par ascendance, parce que cet esclavage est perpétué et par les femmes descendantes d'esclaves. So, what the, commu the international community could not stop is descendant slavery, because it's this hereditary hereditary form that is uh, transmitted through women through um, women considered slaves parce que toute femme descendante d'esclaves so as as we said any women uh, considered a slave et tout enfant qu'elle mettra au monde sont systématiquement deviennent systématiquement des esclaves comme Asa l'a expliqué it's uh, children she would have uh, will be considered a slave as Asa said et ça, c'est un esclavage sans fin. And so this is without end. This is a form of slavery that does not end. Et c'est pourquoi nous luttons contre ça. And that's why we have to, to fight it now. Merci. In the present. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, did you have a question? Can you see the questions? Yes, I, there's only one that okay. I'll ask you. Yeah. Okay. Um, my name's Penny David, and I work for an NGO um, which is active in Ghana, where slavery sounds very different from the slavery that we're hearing about tonight. In Ghana, as far as I know, the former slaves are pretty well integrated nowadays. I mean, there are small things like, for example, um, if, you're, if you're an elder from a slave family, a former slave family, you can't become a village chief. But I don't know that it goes much further than that. And I wonder why the difference, what, what is the reason that your slavery continues without end? And in Ghana, it's pretty much finished. <laughs> 
Um, is it something to do with poverty? Donc, euh, ce que dit la personne, c'est donc elle est euh, engagée dans une euh, dans une ONG du Ghana et de ce qu'elle a de ce qu'elle a vu, de ce qu'elle a compris, au Ghana, les, la forme d'esclavage est assez différente. Donc, il y a quelque chose qui perdure. Par exemple, quand on est un homme âgé dans un village qui descend d'une famille d'esclaves, on ne peut pas en être le chef. Mais à part ce genre de choses, ça a l'air d'être euh, en fait en train de disparaître. Et donc, elle se demande pourquoi il y a ces différences entre les deux pays. Si ça a un rapport avec la pauvreté, je ne sais pas s'il y a des, des choses qui vous viennent à l'esprit. Et cela n'a pas de rapport avec la pauvreté. Euh, J'ai eu euh, l'honneur de participer à une conférence à Yaoundé euh, où nous avons rencontré les chercheurs et beaucoup, beaucoup de chercheurs on a été envoyé par Emifo euh, justement à Yaoundé pour assister à cette conférence-là. Et nous, nous avons décelé euh, là-bas qu'il y a une vingtaine de formes d'esclavage qui existent en Afrique. Bon, nous, notre cas, c'est l'esclavage par ascendance. Donc ça, c'est euh, euh, profondément ancré dans certains milieux tels que le milieu soninké, le milieu Kassonké, le milieu Peul et, euh, et un peu dans le nord aussi du Mali. Mais cela n'a rien à voir avec euh, le problème de, de pauvreté. Et la preuve en est aujourd'hui que la plupart des descendants d'esclaves euh, sont mieux dotés matériellement que la plupart de ces esclavagistes. So, Donc, <laughs> so, uh, so this has nothing to do with poverty. So, um He had the chance to go to Yaoundé for a conference and to meet with um, many researchers and so on, and thanks to the Slavming project. And he, they saw that more than 20 forms of slavery was, were registered. And so this one is uh, decent based slavery. And so it's, it runs in different, um, different backgrounds, especially in the Soninke community. Uh, Kabunke? Kasunke. 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 And for their communities and uh, a bit in the, in the north of Mali. And so it's, um, for him, it's, it has nothing to do with poverty. It's difference to slavery. We have a question from huh? the audience. Can I just read it out to you? No, and, um, and she forgot to translate uh, the last part is that to the extent that today many so-called descendants of slaves are sometimes far richer than the so-called descendants of the enslavers uh, because they migrated, for example, to Europe and uh, and they were able to um, uh, make uh, ends meet. But, but despite that, even as, uh, I mean, I'm added that to what has been said, uh, even In France, where there is no specific, I mean, not poverty to the same extent as back in, in, in Africa. Uh, there are, also, of course, social issues, but this is, of course, different. The system is perpetuated in the diaspora. Also, as I, we said, uh, uh, poverty doesn't come into the pictures in that, such case. Uh, J'ai rajouté que, uh, juste pour dire que, même au niveau de la diaspora, ils ont perpétué le système alors qu'il n'y a pas de question de pauvreté. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me just, uh, we, have a, we have only one question from the audience. If I can encourage members of the audience to please ask questions. So uh, the question is, are there descent-based slavery activities or movements in Nigeria? So it's a question about what, else is, what, what about the rest of West Africa If you, if you have any sort of comparative insights, Donc, la, what the la question c'est est, est-ce que vous savez s'il y a cette forme de d'esclavage en au Nigeria donc et dans le reste de l'Afrique de l'Ouest? Oui, euh, dans le reste de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, euh, au Nigeria, il y a cette forme d'esclavage et aussi euh, euh, dans les pays comme euh, les deux Guinées, euh, Guinée-Bissau et Guinée-Conakry et euh, le, le, le Sénégal, la Mauritanie, la Gambie, justement, et puis euh, le Mali, euh, le Niger, euh, le Niger et euh, le Burkina Faso. Donc, okay. dans la plupart des pays de l'Afrique de l'Ouest où il y a ces communautés soninkées, 
des communautés Peul, des communautés Kassonke euh, et des communautés aussi, euh, euh, comment on appelle, Mandingue. Donc, euh, ce phénomène d'esclavage existe partout où ils vont. Comme on a expliqué dans notre intervention, euh, même euh, aux États-Unis, ça existe parce qu'ils ont émigré là-bas. Et en Europe, ça existe parce qu'ils sont parmi vous ici. Et ainsi de suite. Partout où ils vont dans le monde, ils essaient d'exporter ça. So yes, this, this form of slavery exists uh, elsewhere in, in West Africa. So um, I quoted uh, the case of Nigeria, Niger, Senegal, Gambia, two Guineas, Guinea-Bissau and Guinea-Conakry, and in Mali. And so it since uh, it has a link with some um, very large communities, so uh, Fulbe community, uh, Saninke community, Kasunke community, so it's everywhere they go, they can carry on these practices of uh, descent-based slavery, uh, even in the US and uh, etc. So uh, definitely it exists in other parts of West Africa. Thank you. Esteban? I thank you so much uh, for this very moving um, presentation and project. Uh, all together, my name is Steon Salas. I'm a lecturer in African history here at SOAS. And I have two questions. One is about women. Um, does the identity of having uh, uh, the, the slave identity legacy come from the women themselves? Or is there a way to prove this historically? In other ways, in, in, in other words, um, is this uh, attribution of an slave identity a possibility for illegal enslavement, right? Uh, although we are not talking here about legal terms, but, um, or is that something people recognize for themselves freely? And the other question is, well, it seems like the state is pretty much absent uh, from, from the area. And if it is present in, in the name of authorities, then it's in a very weak way, right? Does this absence or weakness of the state have to do anything with the legacies of French colonialism? And if so, does France recognize any responsibility in this? In other words, do reparations play a role in this story. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Donc, euh, déjà, il vous remercie pour, euh, pour cette présentation qui avait beaucoup d'aspects émouvants. Donc, il y a deux questions. Donc, la première, c'est par rapport aux femmes. Donc, si j'ai bien compris, et tu me corrigeras, euh, c'est la question, est-ce que les femmes transmettent euh, l'esclavage euh, Je vais avoir du mal. Le, 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 le une identité. Est-ce qu'elles elles, elles se reconnaissent elles-mêmes esclaves Elles acceptent ça Elles le transmettent Est-ce que cette identité est transmise, en, non seulement euh, quoi, est transmise par les femmes Le fait qu'elles, elles soient les, 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 en majorité les esclaves et les victimes d'esclavage par ascendance et qu'elles aient des enfants, est-ce qu'il euh, y a une transmission identitaire de l'identité d'esclave par, par les femmes Et comment ça, ça se passe et la deuxième question, ce sera au niveau du rôle de l'État, mmh. qui semble assez absent dans ce que vous dites. Et donc, est-ce que cette absence a aussi une, une relation avec l'histoire de l'héritage de la colonisation française Et si oui, est-ce que la France reconnaît une responsabilité ou est-ce qu'il y a des, des formes de réparation dans, sur ces questions Sur ces questions, voilà. Alors, merci beaucoup pour votre question. Euh, ce qui est pour les femmes il n'y a pas de, il y a aucune femme qui accepterait d'être esclave, en fait. C'était quelque chose qui a été soumis depuis, euh, c'est, euh, c'est par ascendant, en fait, vu que ça descend et qu'on te dit que tu es esclave, mais c'est pas une étiquette qui est sur toi. Ça se, c'est pas quelque chose qui se voit. Yes, uh, so there is no woman who would accept to be a slave by uh, her own choice. So it was really something that was imposed from the outside and that was passed, passed on and passed on. And so there, there is, it's still something that is imposed from the outside. And 
the um, the women themselves doesn't wear uh, this etiquette um, by choice and. Alors, par contre, par exemple, en ce moment, je pourrais vous dire qu'il y a des hommes qui veulent que l'esclavage reste toujours en chez nous, qui veulent rester toujours esclaves. Donc, nous, on se bat contre eux, pas simplement les esclavagistes, parce qu'ils ne veulent pas que ça s'arrête, en fait. Ils veulent que ça continue et il n'y a pas d'intérêt. Ils n'ont pas d'intérêt du tout, du tout dessus, mais ils veulent que ça reste. Yeah. So what she says is that there are some slaves that um, wanted to remain the same, that doesn't want any change, but it's mostly men, uh, in fact. And so women are more, more in the fight against this. And so the, the men that uh, want slavery to, to keep going are not slavers and they don't have any interest in it, but they suffer less from its consequences. Donc, pour eux, c'est comme, euh, c'est la coutume, ça doit rester. J'ai trouvé ça avec mon père, ma grand-mère, ça doit rester, alors que ce n'est pas le cas. Ma grand-mère, mon grand-père, c'était leur temps, mon temps maintenant, on doit avancer. So, there, are, there is a justification from some slaves, for example, that it was, it's something, it's just a custom, and it's, it was something that I received from my father, from my grandmother, and that I inherited, and it's okay, and it's not the case. It is something, and that was the case in the past, but my time is now the present, and I want things to go on, to change. And uh, to uh, answer the question regarding uh, French colonialism and its impact on slavery, um, um, clearly, uh, despite this official abolition, um, as we have seen elsewhere, uh, the colonial authorities turn a blind eye onto the situation. I mean, the 20 years after the official abolition, they just said, anyway, it's a finished business. We have abolished slavery, so it's all done. No need to go into that again to check whether there is slavery happening still. Um, what the French authorities are more concerned about these days is the fact that there are a number of binationals, uh, French Malians, who are concerned with that. And when people were forcibly expelled from their villages, They turned for first to the Malian authorities who didn't want to, to deal with that. And, but there were some binationals in these populations, which had to, which were expelled. So they turned to the French embassy in, in Mali. They did a sitting in front of the French embassy saying, we are binationals. How, how is it possible that we are expelled from our own villages like this and victims of violence? So the French embassy apparently, from what I understood, uh, contacted the, the Malian authorities and, and pressured them to, uh, find a solution. But that was just in the moment because they were basically sitting in front of the embassy and making a lot of, 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 uh, of noise uh, and to contest the situation. So now this, some of this population are still hosted somewhere in Bamako, but there is no, no long-standing support from the government. What they are even more concerned about is, is the security situation. The French, they are afraid, and I had this conversation with some of them, the French authorities, they are concerned that, as I said, Again, the authorities, Malian or French, they think that because of, of the, the violence and the frustration uh, of which uh, uh, these populations are victims, that they will turn to terrorism. So what they are more afraid of is the reimportation of terrorism through migration to France with a bunch of people frustrated turning to terrorism. What I explained to them is that anyway, this terrorism predated Uh, this, this, these, uh, tensions in these villages and, uh, terrorism, terrorists just exploit these tensions. But basically right now, I mean, anyone for any kind of background has reasons linked with the, the fact that the, the state in Mali is very weak to be, has every reason to be frustrating, frustrated and to turn to terrorism and, and, 
no matter whether they are discriminated as as formerly enslaved uh, descendants of slaves or they are from from the elite and the nobility etc i mean there are enough reasons to turn to terrorism unfortunately i mean not no good reasons obviously but um just stop calling the victims a terrorist <laughs> i keep saying and try to understand where the vulnerabilities are is when they are the the state is not here in in these regions. Yeah. So no talk of reparation anyway. We have another question. Hello, hello. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, very touching stuff. Um, I've, I guess I've got a Mali specific question, and there was a brief mention that um you're gaining some ground and materializing some laws. Uh, recently and i'm wondering what the influence of uh, regime changes and the interim governments are in the uh, in your struggle i guess against descendant based slavery in mali thank you uh, donc la, la question là est à propos de ah, du coup j'ai perdu le fil pardon uh, donc apparemment uh, ce qu'il a compris c'est qu'il y avait quand même un changement au niveau uh, du gouvernement uh, on pouvait espérer qu'il y ait une loi qui passe etc est-ce que c'est lié aussi au changement de gouvernement Bon, je, je pour, il l'a pas dit, mais clairement, le fait qu'il y ait eu euh, un coup d'État, deux coups d'État d'ailleurs, et euh, du coup l'arrivée euh, des militaires au pouvoir, est-ce que ça a une influence sur ce qui se passe euh, au niveau du gouvernement et de la prise de conscience de... Ou, mais En tout cas, ce que nous pouvons noter, c'est que euh, euh, l'ancien gouvernement qui était en place euh, n'a pas voulu du tout du tout s'occuper de de ce phénomène euh, de la lutte euh, contre l'esclavage le, par ascendance. Pourquoi Parce que c'était des élus. So what we can say is that people, the former government didn't want to get involved in the in resolving the issue of uh, disembodied slavery. And so he explains that uh, it was partly because they, was, uh, they were elected. Alors, les élus, ils travaillent pour leur majorité. Or que euh, le gouvernement en place, qui est un gouvernement militaire, alors eux, ils essayent de euh, mettre de l'équité, de la justice dans les affaires de l'État. So, he explains that uh, elected people tend to... Um, tend to seek to please the, the majority... Uh, whereas uh, here, which is a, a military government, they um, they tend to seek more equity and justice in state. Ben, je peux dire oui, c'est le changement de gouvernement euh, qui a fait de sorte que aujourd'hui nous avons un projet de loi et que nous espérons bien que ce projet de loi sera voté avant la fin de euh, de la transition afin qu'il y ait une loi comme une loi criminalisant l'esclavage par ascendance euh, comme la Mauritanie la Gambie par exemple. So this is under this government that there were a law uh, that this project of law um, criminalizing this and slavery uh, is to be adopted and they really hope to see it coming before the end of the transition so that there is really a law that uh, criminalizes such acts of violence and discrimination. Like there is a law in Mauritania and the Gambia and Niger. Niger, Niger. Uh, and I, I can add um, that's what we also tried as a project uh, to do in our advocacy is uh, to to see, I mean, to make under uh, the, the authorities understand. This is your opportunity now. You 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 call for a transition, uh, for change in the governance. That that will be in all your benefits to pass this law now as a as a, a, a milestone in the transition. If they do it, that's up to them. But, uh, I try at at least. Hmm? Yeah. No. Uh, not please come in. Yeah, just uh, to also 
a bit of the longer history of uh, Malian and other go governments not being very willy to, willing to support anti-slavery activism, uh, whether it's Kambana or Tenet or other movements. Um, some uh, governors or, or presidents have uh, in silence uh, supported uh, somehow some of the movements, but didn't want to be associated with this issue because it's so uh yeah stigmatizing and shameful to associate oneself with this uh, past that people get worried that they will be, get um reproaches or be even uh, define themselves as probably being of slave descent and so the whole issue of slave uh of being categorized as uh, belonging to the group of formerly enslaved is uh, very Big and especially in politics, it has very often been used to disqualify people. And so, for example, uh, one of Mali's former presidents, ATT, has been described on the first page of a book of one of his adversaries, uh, who published under an anonymous name of uh, Le Sphinx. He actually mentions that ATT, this former president, must have been of slave descent or. Uh, categorized as being of slave descent because um, he is clearly not capable of ruling the country. And of course, someone who is coming, has, has this background, is not capable of ruling. So there's this long history of the history of slavery being used to disqualify people to actually be able to have authority and to take on positions of authority and uh, political positions. I, I have to apologize to some members in our online audience. Say so a few questions. I, I'm not, I don't quite know how I missed it. I kept on checking and I don't know if they just flooded in or not. But um, there's a question from uh, my very close colleague, Ida Hajivanius, who asks um, about the nature of per perceptions of descent based slavery amongst the youth in the diaspora. So she says, I'm interested in the perception of descent slavery among young people in the diaspora, for example, in France or Belgium. You mentioned that young couples are sometimes forced not to marry. Some do. And who do you say that there's a huge difference in how decent slavery is perceived amongst the youth? C'est uh, la question sur um, uh, la perception de l'esclavage par ascendance dans les jeunes générations de la diaspora en France ou ailleurs, en Europe et dans le monde. Uh, vous avez mentionné qu'il y avait des mariages qui n'étaient pas possibles, d'autres qui ont pu... Que, comment les jeunes se positionnent, se positionnent se position mm -hmm. par rapport à ces questions et s'ils se positionnent euh, En ce qui concerne l'implication de la jeunesse euh, par rapport à l'existence de l'esclavage par ascendance, et nous avons, euh, nous, 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 nous continuons à les sensibiliser et euh, la plupart des jeunes euh, tombent des nues quand ils vont, par exemple, euh, dans leur pays d'origine, que ce soit le, le Mali, Sénégal, Mauritanie et autres, et arriver là-bas en vacances, c'est là où ils se rendent compte que euh, ils sont descendants d'esclaves. Parce que, euh, de toutes les façons, et quand on est issu de cette communauté, euh, les esclavagistes font tout pour te le faire comprendre dès qu'ils te voient. En disant, voilà, bon, nous, nous sommes euh, euh, descendants, nous sommes des esclavagistes, nous sommes des, des maîtres et vous êtes des descendants d'esclaves. Donc aujourd'hui, les jeunes, petit à petit, commencent à, à prendre la mesure concrète de ce phénomène euh, dans la diaspora et pour euh, euh, essayer de pallier à ce qui peut leur, leur arriver quand ils vont aller au pays ou même ici, comme je l'ai euh, souligné dans mon intervention, euh, quand il y aura question... Euh, entre deux jeunes des deux communautés, de se marier ou euh, de vivre ensemble comme ça. Donc, euh, tout cela est surveillé à la loupe et tout cela est, euh, est euh, comment dirais-je, euh, banni pour les esclavagistes. OK, so there is really a, a huge effort to raise awareness among the young people um, about this and slavery because some of them are not even aware that they are of uh, slave descent. 
um, they come to, uh, for, for example, they live in Europe and they come to their origin country, whether Mauritania or Mali or Niger. And they are reminded constantly that, in fact, there are some descendants of slaves. And the slavers always keep going with, we are the master, you are a slave. And so sometimes they can be really bewildered by the extent um, to which it goes because they didn't even know by coming in. And so they get involved in it um, by re- realizing, by taking the measure of, of the phenomenon. And uh, there is also the cases of people that came, um, that just fall in love and can't marry um, with someone, uh, even even in Europe, with someone of another uh, origin, let's say. And so these young people are more uh, seldomly concer- uh, directly concerned, but when they are, they are eaten quite uh, seriously, and so they, they want to get involved once they realize. Et ce qu'il faut ajouter que euh, nous sommes très heureux de voir l'affluence des jeunes récemment euh, lors de nos manifestations anti-esclavagistes. And so we are really happy to, to see that young people get more and more involved in our demonstration in uh, the anti-slavery movement. Thank you. There's another a question I noticed that a lot of typing an answer to it. Um, so perhaps you could just um, tell us a lot. But the question is, what role do you think the construction of post-colonial national narrative has had on the amnesia around descent-based slavery? Again? What role do you think the construction of post-colonial nar- national narrative okay. has had on the amnesia around descent-based slavery? Donc, quel rôle ont joué euh, la construction des régimes euh, nationalistes euh, postcoloniaux dans justement l'amnésie qui a, et le tabou qu'il y a eu autour de l'esclavage par ascendance Alors, ce que je voulais expliquer tout à l'heure, c'est que <coughs> la colonisation a frappé de, de plein fouillet et toutes les deux communautés. Donc, euh, l'esclavage par ascendance n'était pas aussi... Euh, euh, vu comme euh, après la colonisation parce que chacun d'eux avait le fardeau de la colonisation. So during the colonization both community were it um, quite seriously and so uh, this in the slavery was not as much an issue because both sides were uh, stricken by the um, the weight of colonial power. Et c'est euh, à la fin de la colonisation que les maîtres, beaucoup d'entre eux, se sont fait connaître et ils ont voulu vraiment pratiquer euh, l'esclavage par ascendance à la lettre. And so that's, that's when the colonization and that the master came to make himself um, more known and wanted um, those practices to be um, applied. Alors, j'ai voulu euh, vous expliquer... Euh, euh, c'est quoi les problèmes qui existaient avant So I, I wanted to explain uh, to explain to you what existed before what issues existed before C'est-à-dire que quand les esclavages les enfants des esclavagistes étaient euh, appelés à intégrer l'armée So for, for example when the when the children of slavers were called to come into the army alors, ils mettaient les, à, leur, à la place de leurs enfants les enfants des, des descendants d'esclaves. They sent instead the children of their slaves. Et un autre phénomène sur les études. And uh, another phenomenon on studies. Moi-même, j'ai été victime de, de cela. I was myself victim of this. Et quand on était euh, dans, dans, les, dans les villages, on, on avait le droit d'étudier jusqu'au collège. So when we were in the villages, we had uh, the right to study until um, secondary school. school. Et quand on arrive au lycée, on fait tout pour qu'on ne puisse, on puisse pas avoir son bac. And when we get to high school, everything is done for us not to be able to graduate. Et même lors des élections, on demande, les esclavagistes mettent tous leurs points d'honneur pour qu'un descendant d'esclaves puisse pas, puisse pas faire partie des élus. 
And uh, during elections, the survivors are really putting all their efforts uh, to prevent uh, some people assigned with slave status to be elected. Oui, yeah. si, si, donc si, to prevent to be elected. Oh, yeah. Donc, c'est la ségrégation à tous les niveaux. Euh, voilà, on pense aux études, on pense à l'armée, on pense aussi euh, même à l'émigration. On fait tout pour que, il faisait tout pour que les descendants d'esclaves ne puissent pas arriver à un meilleur avenir. So, um, whereas regarding army, regarding studies, regarding immigration, uh, slavers really put all their efforts to prevent people to access a better future when they were assigned with slave status. And I should add also that uh, post-colonial regimes, uh, like the ones of Modibo Keita, the first president of Mali, uh, in their discourses, they promoted citizenship and equality in rights. And they insisted on that. And that's why some, um, some who were still enslaved uh, decided hearing this kind of discourses to escape slavery and to build new lives as well. But still, the main focus was on um, anti-colonialism and this idea that actually slavery was a, a, um, the, the, the way this nationalist discourses this, um, uh, define colonialism, uh, it, they define it as slavery. And that's where it blurred to some extent the, the, the discourse and the fight against slavery as we know it, this is slavery, because all the discourses about slavery were not about decent based slavery, but were against colonialism. Um, so even despite this promotion of citizenship, basically uh, uh, decent based slavery was never publicly discussed by the authorities in Mali uh, on, on on the long term. There were some discourses locally, but very, very, very few of them. So uh, um, that basically there was a, a complete silence, I mean, a, a long-term silence uh, about these issues, and which remained nonetheless a, a public secret. Nobody talked about it, or nobody wanted to talk about it, but everybody knew. And that's why sometimes it re-emerged. We mentioned the case of, of politics and how some politicians were uh, disqualified because said to be of, uh, uh, of uh, descendants of formerly enslaved. Uh, but um, that's when it resurfaced. But, um, but so just to say there was no public space to listen to the victims, people didn't want to hear them. It's not that they couldn't, the victims couldn't speak about the situation, is that there was no uh, authority ready to, to, to listen to them. We, we've come to the end of our time, yeah. um, but if uh, it's okay with our speakers, if I could just allow one further question and then we'll call it a day. Um, so the question is from Martin Klein, who wants to know, uh, does Campana have support among the professional elites, especially amongst lawyers, teachers, professors, these sorts of people, civil servants? Uh, he, he, he pose la question, uh, c'est une question en ligne. Donc, c'est, est-ce qu'il y a, um, est-ce que vous êtes, uh, um, soutenu par l'élite, par, uh, par les intellectuels, par les enseignants? Est-ce que vous arrivez uh, à avoir une partie de l'élite avec vous? Oui, nous commençons euh, à être soutenus par une partie de l'élite. Et comme euh, vous le savez, dans toutes les luttes euh, de classe, et euh, euh, les, les intellectuels sont les derniers arrivés. So, yes, we we are starting to be supported by the elites. But um, as you know, in all in any class fight. Um, the intellectuals are always, are always the last uh, coming. <laughs> je ne suis pas anti-intellectuel, mais ce que j'ai voulu dire, c'est que c'est le constat que nous avons fait. Euh, c'est après quelques années de lutte que nous avons été rejoints par euh, certains intellectuels, euh, pas tous, mais qui nous soutiennent vraiment à fond. Yeah, I, I am not anti-intellectual. That's just the conclusion I drew. Um, um, but some intellectual uh, came to us uh, after a few years of uh, fighting and slavery, 
and um, not all of them, but those who support us, uh, really support us. Nous, nous avons aussi le soutien de euh, certains intellectuels, euh, euh, les érudits, les, les intellectuels coraniques, euh, hein, voilà, qui, 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 sont, qui s'investissent beaucoup dans l'explication de l'esclavage par ascendance, euh, parce que euh, nous avons, euh, ils ont voulu mettre une connotation religieuse dans la dans l'explication dans l'explication de l'esclavage par ascendance. And and we are also um, uh, joined by some Muslim intellectuals that really are committed to educate um, people on uh, distant base slavery because the slavers um, put into uh, distant base slavery and a religious uh, argument, whereas it was not at first. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, all, all that's left for me to do is to thank our speakers very warmly for giving us an incredibly enriching evening. And then to thank members of our audience, both uh, people present here as well as the online audience for their very interesting and stimulating questions. Um, lot is, lot. I saw you were typing a question for a very long time, also typing an answer for a very long time, so I don't know if you want to finish it, but I think this chat will be recorded, won't it? Yep. Yeah, I hope so. so hopefully we'll, we'll have a record of today's events um, for people who want to look at um, to look at things afterwards. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marie. Thank you, everyone else, for organizing the event.